And uh, I know I saw one plea on the, on the Facebook. Somebody is pleading for them. And uh, I've talked to a couple of people and I've got uh, either uh, may have two, I may have two committed, one possible uh, that I've talked to this week. Crews are coming. Um, hopefully his wife come. I know he's going to be here. His wife will probably come. But uh, they'll be here. He was raised Lutheran. Uh, but he's, I think they're looking. His wife was raised Catholic. But uh, I saw them the other day and invited them. And he said, yeah, I'll, I'll be there. So he said, I've been wanting to hear you preach. And I, so I said, oh, I started to tell him, I hope you're not disappointed, but I didn't want to discourage him. <laughs> but I just told him what a great church we had and enjoyed it coming. Uh, he was with us a year or so ago in, at First Baptist. and Didn't know what was going on. I had, he sat by me and we had to kind of explain a few things because Lutheran worship a little bit differently than we. Kind of had to explain what Baptists do along the way, you know, kind of like the fellow's little boy said when a, when an old time preacher pulled out his pocket watch and and he laid it on the pulpit and the little boy said, "Now what does that mean?" The little kid sitting next to him said nothing. <laughs> That's kind of the way it goes, isn't it? But, but anyway, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Uh, we have some prayer requests that I want to share with you. Brother Derry Hadfield is on the prayer list. Does anybody know why he's on the prayer list? He had a test. Oh, did he? Okay. I knew he'd been sick. I talked to him uh, one night last week. He told me he'd been sick. I didn't know he was having tests. Uh, let's remember the Steph Stephanie Meek, Meek family. Uh, Stephanie grew up, uh, she attended our church at White Oak for a number of years, off and on. Um, but she's kind of had a sister, and that's maybe a step person. But let's let's pray for that family. Uh, Shelby a Cobbage family. Uh, she's a brother to Judy Ham. Also uh, Joyce Van Pelt with cancer. Uh, Jessica Hayes, three, uh, thirty-four year old, uh, going to remove a leg. Let's pray for her. Uh, Brandon Hargrove, uh, health issues. Also, Sarah Davis, a 10-year-old girl who's undergoing final test to receive a kidney transplant. This was the one that um, uh, Ms. Tanya was going to, Tuano was going to give a kidney to, and uh, that did not transpire. So let's be praying for them and also praying for Tuano as well. Uh, also, let's continue to pray for Brother Paul Coomer, uh, he's making some progress, but let's continue to pray for him. Scott Woods, as he continues to make progress. Uh, Shelby uh, Cobbage, I think I've already mentioned her. Uh, Ellen, Miss Ellen Creekmore, they've moved her test up, one test tomorrow and the other one Friday. Let's remember that, her in prayer as she goes in test. Also, let's continue to pray for Scott Rose's neighbor who had underwent some tests. Um, also, let's continue to pray for Brother Mac and Miss Judy Ledbetter. They thought they would be here tonight, but they're not. Let's also be praying for uh, uh, Brother Eddie Glover as he continues to make progress. Uh, also, uh, the uh, Drusilla uh, Fritz uh, family. Uh, Miss Fritz was a, 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 an acquaintance of ours as well. She was uh, Miss Dorothy Phelps, is a friend that she graduated with. I knew Miss Drusilla from, from uh, Ferguson when I was there very fine, fine lady. Also, let's uh, remember um, uh, Dylan Gaskin. Um, his test went well, but let's continue to pray for him. And um, so let's, there's just a lot of people that we need to pray for. Let's continue to pray. And there's a long, long list in our bulletin, of course. Let's continue to pray for them. Also, let's continue to pray for our first responders, our military people, our youth ministry, as it continues to our young people there and our, our workers who continue to work there and uh, we're grateful for the progress that's being made so let's continue to pray for them and others along the way uh, any other requests would you just lift your hand or you want to voice it we'll take that request all right let's we'll ask our ushers to come and receive our offering for us this evening as we go to the lord in prayer brother keith would you lead us please
Amen. Page number 394. I was lost in sin, but Jesus rescued me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was bound by fear, but Jesus set me free. He's a wonderful Savior to me. For He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a friend so true, so patient and so kind. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Everything I need in Him I always find. He's a wonderful Savior to me. For He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Dearer grows the love of Jesus day by day. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Sweeter is His grace while pressing on my way. He's a wonderful Savior to me. For He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Amen. He has been for a long, long time. And... Uh, I go back many, many years ago to the time that the Lord saved my soul at 11 years old. And that's been a long time ago, 75 years almost. So he's been a wonderful Savior to me. And I'm grateful that God has given me the opportunity not only to be saved by the wonderful grace of God, but that God's given me an opportunity to serve him these many years as well. And what a, what a sweet, sweet blessing that has been down through the years. So turn with me please in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to try to finish tonight. I'm not going to guarantee that, but we're going to try to finish chapter 1 tonight because it depends on a lot of things. But, you know, 
I've entitled the message, I'll go ahead and, I don't do that very often when I'm doing, going through a book, but I'm going to do that tonight, uh, going, uh, going for the gold. Going for the gold. That's what we're working for, right? Going for the gold. And so in, in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. The eyes of our understanding being enlightened, that we may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward who believe according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places. For above all principalities and powers and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under His feet, and gave Him to be the head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of Him that, that filleth all in all. You know, there are many, many riches for the child of God. In the, in the inheritance for those who are faithful in the Lord. And among those are five crowns that are mentioned in the Word of God. And we're going to mention some of those tonight as we, as we talk about it. And also then hopefully we get into the last, and that is the eternal, the eternal position for the New Testament church. Because these lessons touch upon all those, all those things. And we're going to and the reason for this lesson tonight is not just that we're going through the book, but that is we will gain a deeper understanding of our need to serve God in a very faithful, faithful way. And I know that I'm preaching to the, to the cream of the crop because you're the one that basically come here on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and uh, yet you also share the message. And because you're the cream of the crop, then you're the one that needs the message as well as anyone. But you need to re be reminded of what God has in store for you in, in the years to come. Because God has something more than what we have now. You know, isn't it wonderful that, that God keeps a record of everything that we do? And uh, one day, we're going to be talking about that, but one day God's going to look at our record. It's not, he's not looking at our record because of our sins. Those sins have all been taken care of with the blood of Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary. So we're not going to have to face our sins. You can say praise God for that. Because I mean we're, you're, I know you're Baptist and I know we're not used to raising our hands and I know we're not used to saying amen or stomping our feet or, or anything rolling on the floor or jumping pews or anything like that. You know, I, I, that don't hurt anything but we're not going to get used to that because we're Baptists. Every now and then people are laughing and I tell them, I said, you're having too much fun. Remember, you're Baptist. So you're not supposed to laugh and, you know, and carry on. We're supposed to have a sad face because we're, we're saved. Amen? No, that's not true. We're, we're, we're here to have a good time in the Lord and, uh, and to fellowship one with another and just fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ because God has given us something. He's given us something for here and now, and He's given us something for in the hereafter. And I know that we live in the nasty here and now, but we, we don't have to dwell, we don't have to wallow in the, in the filth of sin and, and crud of this world. We can overcome that because, as I pointed out a, a couple of weeks ago, that basically we're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory. We already have victory. And as soon as we can grab a hold of that in our hearts, and this makes something real to us that we've won the battle. We have won the victory. And we're living in victory. Only when we allow Satan and the cares of this life to, to grab hold of us, then are we pulled downward. But we don't have to be that way. We can enjoy the blessings of Christianity now and we can enjoy the future blessings that is to come. And that's what we want to do. That's what we want to talk about tonight. 
because Paul wrote it in, in, in uh, Romans chapter 8. And I know I don't always do this, but I want to do this tonight. In Romans chapter 8, turn with me please in your Bibles to the 15th verse. Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. When you found it, say amen. Now Romans follows Acts. Acts follows John. <coughs> Romans is just before 1 Corinthians. Now if you're looking for the book of Hezekiah, it'll take you a little longer. <laughs> but let's read verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now think about that for a moment. Let's go back and just look at that. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. We have not received the spirit to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption. Now then, let's think about that for a moment. We're not, when we're saved, we're born. We're given a new birth. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus. What happens is when we're saved, and I know this is, you know, Baptist Doctrine 101, but I know you probably understand that. But how do we get to it without explaining to you? When we're saved, the new birth is that God implants within us a new spiritual life. The Spirit of God begins to indwell on us. And that Spirit never leaves us. It is always there. And there is that, there is that fleshly nature and there is that spiritual nature that the child of God has, and they're continuously rubbing one another, and there's friction between the fleshly nature and the spiritual nature. And so we can decide which one we want to win. If we want to have spiritual input and spiritual power, then we yield to the power of God. We read the Word, we yield to the Spirit, we pray, and we humble ourselves to God. If we want the things of the world, which makes us double-minded, then we begin to think about fleshly things, worldly things. You say, well, I don't think about worldly things. When you think about worldly things, I'm not talking about adultery. I'm not talking about bank robbery. I'm not talking about those things. I'm not talking about the sins that, that we categorize because we categorize sin. God doesn't, but we do. We make sin... You know, we have some sins that are scarlet. You know, wow, if, if we commit adultery, that's a scarlet sin. Amen? If we rob a bank, that's a scarlet sin. But it's okay if this little white sin over here is envy. Same sin. Amen. Same sin. You see, we categorize sin. God doesn't categorize sin. Because one sin, no matter what it is, it can darnish, it can carnate, varnish, and so cripple us. So what do we do when we do that? We repent. Now the word repent is simply that we do about face. That we turn around. That's what we do. We confess that sin to God and then we leave that at the altar of God. That's becoming yielding to the, flesh, to the Spirit of God and turning away from the flesh. That is repentance. That's what it is. And so God wants us to do that. Now then, let's go to verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How do we know that we're saved? We know that we're saved because the Spirit of God witnesses with our spirit. The Spirit that God implants within us the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, witnesses with that which is implanted in us when we're saved by the grace of God. God witnesses to us and tells us that we're saved by the Holy Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God witnesses to us day by day. And it also, have you ever noticed that sometimes, I'm way off the, I'm chasing rabbits I guess tonight, but it's something you need. Uh, you know, but you know, sometimes we, we get to thinking, well, you know, I, I need to do this, and I, I think this, and, and all of a sudden there's something comes in our mind, maybe a song. You ever have that done, Miss Lois? 
I have lots of times. I'll be thinking, then there's a song that pops in my, in my heart, and I, I, it just begins to dwell in my mind. You know what that is? That's the Spirit of God working with us. It may be a, it may be a verse of Scripture. Or it may be someone else's testimony that they have just given us. That is God's way of witnessing with our spirit. Just like when I preach to the congregation, that is God's way of witnessing to you. You know, it isn't me, it is God speaking. I'm hoping that God speaks to us so that we can understand that. So the Spirit of God witnesses to us that we're children of God. Helps us to understand that, that we're God's children. Look at verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified, also glorified together. Now, think about what He said. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs, with Christ. Now, here's where this thing comes in that I want to share with you. When we're born again, this is where we started a while ago when we got a couple of other things in our mind. But when we're saved, God indwells with us the Spirit of God. That's the new birth. We've been there. Now then, what God does then, He adopts us. Now, we're already, we're already children of God. But what the adoption does it makes us heirs of God. In other words, what is an heir? Someone that receives an inheritance. So what God does is He makes us acceptable that we might receive an inheritance from God, which lays into the future more than into the present. The, the present is the blessings of God, the airship comes in, into the future blessings, which probably most of them are the millennial, and then it goes into something greater than that, that we'll, if we have time, we'll get in tonight. But then look in, uh, in verse 8, I mean 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, we're heirs of God, but listen to what he said. We're joint heirs in Christ. Now, what is a joint heir? That's when two, two people inherit equally. <coughs> now, what is he saying? The glory that Jesus Christ received when he arose from the grave, ascended into, into heaven, that is the glory of God. Then when, we're, when, we're, when we are saved, we, we have that adoption ship, we're able to be joiners with Christ. And then when we get into glory, we're going to share the same glory that Jesus Christ shared. The glory of God is going to shine. That's why John wrote in 1 John, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that we shall be like who? Him. For we shall see Him as He is. Now, let's pause that for just a moment. Put that a little bit on the on pause. When Jesus Christ ascended, not ascended, but when He appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration, what did He look like? There His, his, his countenance was bright and pure and holy. As I pointed out the other day, had there been one grain of imperfection in him at that moment, had there been one speck of imperfection in him, he would have exploded. But he didn't. That was the glory of God. Now what, what we're going to have when we get, when we transport ourselves or God transports us, either or, you know, there are a lot of ways to get into glory. We can leave here quickly with an accident, or we can just ag along through sickness and, you know, finally drag it out and we finally die slowly and we get to glory. Those are not important things, but, you know, what, how do we get there? When we get there, what's going to happen? We have changed, we have been changed 
from a earthly to a spiritual nature. And that spiritual nature then is made in the image of the glorious God. That we're made in the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have that glorified state. Now I don't know all there is, is there to know about that. All I know is when Jesus Christ arose from the grave, He appeared to the church, and they were meeting, a little bit downcast maybe, and Jesus appeared, just walked through the door. He didn't open it, didn't say He did, He just walked through the door. And there He was. And they told Thomas about it, and he said, I don't believe that. So the next Sunday morning when he met, Thomas was there. He said, I want to see this thing. And the Lord appeared again, walked through the door. And Thomas said, oh, I, I, I believe now. He said, if I could have just seen his nail, nail hands and, and there's holding his side, I would have believed that he is Christ. And when Christ appeared the second time on the second next Sunday morning, he said, Thomas, here's my hand and here's my side. And Thomas said, I believe you're the risen Christ. You see, he had the marks of a crucified Christ, but he had the body of a glorified Christ. Now, I don't know. I'm not smart enough to comprehend, nor have I talked to anybody smart enough to comprehend that they cannot tell me how this is going, what we're going to look like. I have this question asked to me all the time. People say, well, how are we going to look like when we get there? I don't know. Miss Ellen's probably going to look like Miss Ellen. Some way, I'm hoping they'll improve me, but, you know. All I know is I won't have to wear glasses, won't have to wear hearing aids, won't have, won't have this heart valve. I won't have to worry about those things. Praise God, that's all taken care of. Amen. We're not getting, we're not getting we're very far, are we? <laughs> I thought I was going to get through this. Let's look at these things real quick, like in, um, in Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to go back there and just kind of look at that because there are five crowns, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here uh, with Ephesians or with these crowns, but I do want to mention, because here's what he said. Uh, first of all, the word crown is from the Greek word stephanos. And uh, that simply means this. It means a, a mark of royalty or an exalted mark of some sort. It means that uh, a mark of honor also interesting that uh, it was placed on, a, on an athlete's head. They would placed a wreath upon his head. And it noted that he was the winner of that athletic event. And um, when they did that, he would, be, uh, he would be there. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 for just a moment. And I want to share with you something that, that I think you'll, you'll enjoy knowing and we, if we don't get into the crowns, we will next week. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul writes us, to us concerning this thing of, of the Bema seat. And um, because I think you need to know this, and that is the children of God will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We mentioned that a moment ago, the judgment seat of Christ. And when we appear before the judgment seat of Christ, there is where our works are tried. Every one of our works are tried. It's there that we receive the crowns of glory that God's going to give us. And so in that we find that Paul wrote these words and he said in verse 12, Now if any man build upon the foundation gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Now, he goes on and said, don't defile the temple. Now, there's three, four things that I'm going to mention here in this thing. And there are four that Jesus said, let's go back and look, and I'm going to sh share them with you, and then we're going to go on. The judgment seat is a seat of reality. And it's found in verse, uh, in verse uh, 13, every man's work shall be made manifest. Every man's work shall be made manifest. The reality of the judgment. And then we also 
find that in that verse is the revelation. It shall be revealed by fire. In other words, the works that we do shall be revealed by fire. And uh, the fire shall uh, do every man's work. And that's the reckoning. You see, the judgment of God is likened unto a furnace. The judge is sitting here, and the divine judgment is, is like a fire, like a divine fire. We appear before the judgment seat, and every one of us are going to appear there with our works. Good or bad, they're going to appear there. And then they're going to be revealed. And then they're going to be tried by the divine justice of God. And they're going to be reckoned with. Every man's work shall either abide or it shall burn like wood, hay, and stubble. And those who, that's, those who abide shall receive a reward. Now that's the, that's the retaliation or the ratification. Their God is going to give to us what we deserve because we have worked these years. Now, wood, hay, and stubble is that, those kind of works that burn. Now, what are those works? Those works are simply this. Those works are those works that we have done basically for ourselves, to promote ourselves. If we do, and I've known a lot of this to happen in churches and preachers and a lot of things, a lot of things that's done to promote our ego. Those works are going to burn. They're gone. But if you do it for the glory of Christ, if you're working for the glory of Christ, those works will, wood, hay, and stubble will burn, but gold, silver, and precious stone, they'll go through the judgment seat of God and, and they'll, like a furnace, the impurities will burn out. And they will come out more pure and more pure. And that's what God blesses. Now then, what are they? Well, let's look at them real quick like. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because, you know, you, and I, need, I know I need to quit right now. But let me just mention those and we might go back to them a little bit later on. First of all, there's a, the victor's crown. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 25 through 27. And I'm not going to go read all those things if you, you need to write them down. We'll go back and get them. But this victor's crown is really self-discipline. Uh, it requires the ability to say no when necessary. Uh, and not just to things that are sinful. But God involves a narrowing focus for us. And uh, those things have a, a very high eternal and value. Uh, life is full of good things to get our focus off of Jesus. And when we get our focus off of Jesus, and even though we're doing good things, but if we got our focus off of Jesus, then we don't get the crown, the victor's crown. Uh, so those who receive such have to discipline themselves and say, I'm doing this for the glory of Christ. And that's what we do. And then if we do that faithfully, each time that we do that faithfully, not just for a lifetime, but every time that we do that faithfully, then there is a crown of, that waits for us. If we're faithful in doing that, there's a crown of rejoicing that we're going to have, or the crown of victor's crown. And the second one is the crown of re rejoicing. And it's often called the soul winner's crown. And it's found in 1 Thessalonians 2, and verse 19. Verse 19. And this, this rejoicing crown is when we actually are, are able to lead someone to the Lord. Uh, you may have a part in it. You may have prayed for that individual and prayed for that individual. Or you may have sat down with them and opened the Word of God. And you may explain to them how they were saved and ask them to, be, ask, them to ask the Lord to be saved. And they trust the Lord at that moment. That's the crown of rejoicing. That's the crown that we're going to get to. Now, one of the reasons it's called a crown of rejoicing is because when we get into glory, those people that we have won to the Lord are going to be there with us. And God, we're going to rejoice because we see them saved. And that's called the crown of rejoicing or the soul winner's crown. And then the third crown is simply this, and that is the crown of righteousness. It's to those who long for heaven and long to see the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who long to see His face. 
My, that would be a great thing to do, the crown of righteousness. And Paul said, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord himself shall give me. So, isn't that wonderful that we can have? Then there's the crown of life. And uh, the crown of life is really uh, those who are try, who, who triumph over persecution and trials and tribulations and those type things. When we're, when we're forced to have tribulations in our lives and persecutions or tr troubles and trials of all kind, then if we, if we endure those faithfully and overcome that, then there's a crown, there's a crown of life that God shall give us at, at that time. At the Bema seat is when that, that's going to happen. And then there's a crown of glory that's found in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4. And that, that crown is basically given to those uh, faithful shepherds of God's people. Pastors, deacons, Sunday school teachers, uh, the ministering team, the leaders, those who dedicate themselves to leading others along the way. And they're faithful in doing that along the way. That there's that, there's that crown that you're going to have that's founded for uh, our abiding crowns. And they shall, most of them, are, are going to endure, are going to be given and endure through the, the millennial age. Basically, we receive them sometime at the Bema seat, which in my opinion is probably somewhere soon after the rapture. Uh, and I'm a free millennialist. I don't know what you are. I believe that Jesus Christ is coming before the tribulation. I'm not a middle of the weaker. I, I've studied that. I've been there. I've looked into it. I'm certainly not a post millennialist. I don't even uh, sell them every post cereal. I don't want to even get involved in post cereal. So I, you know, because I don't want to be, I don't want to be one of those. And I'm certainly not an amillennialist. You know, amillennialist is saying, uh, we're just, if those people believe that, I've got some property, some oceanfront property that I need to sell them right here out of, out of Somerset. Because that ain't happening. You see, there are, there is no amillennium. There is a millennium. The Lord talks about that. And that's a thousand year reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. And during that time, after we receive those crowns, then we're going to live with those crowns during that millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to enjoy that. It's also a special place for us that God has for those people. Now, the grand prize is, and I, I'm just going to mention this, okay? The grand prize is simply this. Those are great things to have. But the grand prize, the ultimate prize, is when we, when we are a part of a New Testament church, and the Lord comes and raptures the people out before the tribulation period. And in Revelation chapter 19, he talks about the marriage of the Lamb and the bride of Christ. And Paul said over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, he said to the church of Corinth, I'm jealous of you because I've espoused you under Christ. In other words, I've engaged you. So the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is really engaged to be married to the Lamb of God. That's Jesus Christ. And that's going to happen near the beginning of the millennial age. That's not written until later on over there, but it's going to happen there. In the 19th chapter, that's going to happen. Now, if you want to know what it's going to look like, let me share with you. In, in, in Revelation chapter 21, verses 9 through 27, I don't have time to get there tonight. And if you, we might have to come back to that sometime. But, you know, if you want to see that, it's found over in Revelation chapter 21, when the Lord says, I'm going to show you the Lamb's wife. And He brings the Lamb's wife down. And John said, I saw the holy city coming down out of heaven, descending, dressed or adorned, like the brown, like the brown's, the lamb's wife, and he gives that description in Revelation 21, the latter part of Revelation 21. Now that's what a lot of people call heaven, but that's not heaven. That's that's the description of the lamb's wife. That's the description of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that has remained faithful, that has taught the doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
and they're going to, they have been faithful through the years. And one day they're going to be raptured out, and they're going to have a place in glory, not only in glory, but they're going to have a place in the millennium. millennium. And in glory, they're going to have that place for an eternity. Now then, Israel is going to be the walls around that. And people are going to come in and out. The nations that are, and the people that are, not set, that are not in the church, they're going to be coming in the gates of the New Jerusalem, which is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're going to be worshiping the Lord there in the temple, the holy temple that is there. And they'll be leaving back out. And then they'll be coming back in to worship. So it's important. It's important that we're faithful to God. It's important that we serve God with all faithfulness because we have a part in glory. We have an inheritance that fadeth not away. And I'm glad. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're going to be a part of that. So we can just enjoy the, God's blessings together with the crowns and with the eternal ultimate glory of God, and that is as the Lamb's wife, the bride of Christ. Let's stand. Father, bless the teachings tonight. Stir our hearts. Help us to love you. Help us to be drawn closer to you. Father, I pray that you would touch our hearts. That even tonight, as we sing this invitation, dear God, that you would that you would move hearts, that you would move them the way that you want them to be moved. Lead them to the altar if they need to come. Give their hearts to the Lord. Give their lives to Jesus. Or whatever they need to do, Father, as we sing this verse of invitation. Dear God, we pray that you touch hearts today. In your name we ask it. Let's sing. What shall we sing? <laughs>